Right. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today on uh, on how to welcoming you to the new you, how to be better with money in 2019 and beyond. My name is Jason Butler and I'm a head of financial education at Salary Finance. And if you're not aware, Salary Finance is an employee benefit that's available to you. And we're on a mission to get people out of debt and into saving and having a great relationship with money. Now, we offer products including affordable loans, which are repaid through your salary, as well as the ability to save money directly from your wage as well. Now, today I'm going to be talking to you about how to change your mindset so that that can help you be better with money and enjoy your life more in 2019. I must just point out for compliance purposes that this content is just for guidance and educational purposes only, and it's very generic in nature. And we don't give regulated individual personal financial advice. So if you need personal help, please seek your own advice and help. Uh, and I'll signpost some of those things for you towards the end. And there will be time for questions at the end. I'm very happy to answer people's questions. I don't know all the answers, but I'll certainly have a good go. Um, and as far as uh, there are no silly questions, by the way, um, do, you know, do think of them as you go. And we'll try and cover as many of those as we can at the end. Now. First and foremost, let's just look at what it means to be financially well. Well, at Salary Finance, we've done quite extensive research on this uh, this year uh, in, and built on all the academic research that's out there. And we've come up with a five point scale of financial fitness stroke wellness. And you start from score one where you're completely out of control and money really stresses you um, and you probably haven't got enough to meet your basic needs. And that's a a very difficult place to be in and there are significant numbers minority of people in that area if you're in that area you can get free money help and support personal help from citizen advice bureau from step change or you can contact the money advice service by just googling them and they will signpost you to personal help there's no need to suffer in silence but then you basically move up the scale um, where you start to have, um, you know, a little bit more resilience, a little bit more opportunity. You're coping a bit more all the way up to financial freedom. So money doesn't really cause you any stress and worry. And you've got enough for all your needs and you've got choices and you can enjoy life. So what we want you to do is get to five and stay there. But we know that life doesn't go in a straight line, that we're all at different situations in our life. We all have different resources and, and, and stuff happens. And when we did the analysis of the cross section of UK employees, we found that the average score was about 3.1. Now, that's interesting. Um, so what it says is that the vast majority of people are really just about limited coping and they only have to have one or two things happen to them to throw them off um, off beam. The actual biggest distribution of people are in the two and the four. So that's where the biggest groupings of people are for some reason. Um, and it's interesting to know that even if you had all the money in the world that you could possibly need, still 8% of people here are, you know, still stressing about money. So it's an it's an emotional point of view there. So what I would suggest you do after today, one thing to do, you can do your own fitness score, which will take you probably less than a minute to answer the questions. You don't need to leave any personal details. No one will know you've done it and it will give you a, your own score and your own score um, will give you an idea of where you are now. Now, your fitness score can change from week to week, month to month, year to year. It's not a static situation. And it'll be just interesting to see how you compare to that 3.1% average. Um, you know, I did I did my uh, score and it came out about 4.4, which is interesting because there are aspects that of the questions that we will all react differently to. But if I'd, if I'd done that test 20 years ago, I'd probably be in a one or a two. So, you know, there's no such thing as a perfect score and we are where we are. Now, let's just talk before I get into the the attitudinal side of things. Let's talk about what we mean by the level of financial well-being and how to deal with it. In a in a sense of dealing with your money, you have to secure the present. And that means that you can't think about anything beyond if you're if you're trying to just get by day to day, then that's a very difficult uh, way of being. But we can all have different levels of um, problems in the short term. For some people, they, they've got enough money, possibly, but they're just disorganized and, and paperwork everywhere. And they, they, they don't tend to paying their bills on time or they have things that become a drama. I know someone who had a parking ticket he never paid and ended up being about 500 pounds or because he couldn't get himself organized. Um, being able to manage debt. Now, you know, there's different types of debt and we all have to have sometimes debt at some stage in our life. 
but managing debt so that it's not a source of frustration and worry and that it's not sort of uh, uh, throwing you off kilter is a key thing. And also being able to deal with a crisis. Most of the people who get into real financial difficulties or financial stresses is because they aren't able to cope with what life throws at them. Now, I'm sure we've all been there where, you know, the car's blown up, your boiler's gone wrong, something's happened. Even your children at school need to go on a trip and you haven't really thought about it and you haven't put the money aside. All sorts of things happen in life, some of which are crises and some of which are just things you hadn't anticipated. So being able to secure your present is absolutely essential before you can then start worrying about or even focusing on, you know, when you can't or don't want to work, you know, becoming financially independent. Um, or setting new goals like, I don't know, planning to buy a house, getting married, uh, marriage of your children, whatever it is, if you're secure in your present, then you can think about the future. So let's just um, let's just think about this, this in a simple thing. If you if you've got control of your finances, that is the absolute foundation because you'll never achieve and maintain a high sense of financial well-being until you've got control. The problem for most of us is that we aren't naturally wired to make good financial decisions. And that's because we've got an instinctive part of our brain, which is the primeval bit when we were living in caves. We all know about this. This is the, the sort of here and now that wants things now. And it values the present much more than the rational thinking uh, about the future. Uh, there is a good chance that you could die. You know, there is a chance you could die, you know, um, in the next week. But there's a high chance, depending on your personal situation, there's much more higher chance of you living till you're 70, 80, even 90. And the chances of you living a long life are increasing all the time. So we always value the present over the dim and distant future. That's just how we are. But we can we can do things to help us be um, uh, to control that instinctive part of our brain. Now, here's the participation bit. Um, we're going to do a, a poll here. I just want you to be as honest as you can. Um, how in control of your day to day finance do you feel? Uh, are you totally out of control? I've got no idea where my money goes. Slightly out of control. I don't seem to be able to get ahead financially. You're in control, but you seem to have money problems from time to time. Or you're totally in control and you rarely have any problems at all. So let's just uh, let's just launch that when I can select the poll. There we go. So please. Um, Go away. Yep, there we go. Very good. Carry on. I'm just about to close it off. Great stuff. OK, so we've got 40 percent of people feel slightly out of control, don't always seem to be out of control. 40 percent are in control, but do have money problems. And 21 percent if you are ninjas. Uh, with money. You're, you're totally in control, never have financial problems or rarely. Well, even the 21% of you, I th still think it's worth you staying on the uh, on the call on the webinar because I, I've got a couple of things here that even if you've got it all covered, um, that you can share these with people who may not be as, as in control as you. But in reality, even people who feel totally in control can get out of control. Uh, it's just that they're not always aware of it. Okay, so let's just... Uh, Let's just move on here. Now, there is a lot on this slide. And let me just spend a bit of time explaining this to you, because it's really, really key part to what I'm going to say um, a bit further down the track. We have the person that we are now emotionally, psychologically. And then there is the ideal person that we either, uh, you know, the, the person that we we want to be um, or, uh, you know, the sort of the reflects who we want to be as a person, where we think we need to be. And our personality has lots of different aspects to it. And for instance, you've got spirituality here at the top, which is completely at odds with being hedonistic. So spirituality, you know, the whole meaning of life, where you are in the world, thinking outwardly, whereas hedonistic is just, you know, having fun now and, and meeting your own uh, immediate needs. Then you've got the, the on the left hand side, you've got fame and image. This is um, this is the external thing, what people see and, and what you present to people versus affiliation and self-acceptance. That's the, the inner core of how you see your self as a person and your connection with people. And then you've got the whole thing of conformity on the top left here, which is, you know, the, the, your need to fit in versus community, your sense of where you belong. Then you have your health, which is clearly very important, your mental and physical health of which, you know, being good with money and not having money stresses is part. And then you've got money over here. So the way to think about this is 
that your emotional status, your emotional sense reflects the gap between where you are now as a person and where you'd like to be as a person. And what happens is that influences your day to day behavior. And from a money point of view, that influences your working, your spending, your borrowing and your investing decisions. And the way to look at it is that if you are focusing on earning and spending and um, external consumption, materialism, that's what we call an extrinsic motivation. You are looking for outside. You're looking for someone else to give you validation. Whereas when we look at uh, over at the community, the affiliation, the kind of um, in, the internal aspect, that's what we call intrinsic motivation. And that is tends to reflect your value. So if your values are very much about um, fame, image, money, acceptance, status, then you've got extrinsic motivation. Whereas if you are more about sort of uh, not about those things and more about um, your way in the world and, and your connection with your fellow man, that will be intrinsic. And. The reason I say that is because I explain that is because the research shows that people who have a very high level of materialism, so very materialistic values, they focus on acquiring money, possession, status, whatever it is, external that things people can see and judge. Those people tend to have much lower levels of well-being and happiness. Now, I'm not making any judgments here about what your values are and uh, what matters to you. I'm just telling you what the research is saying. And one of the biggest underlying causes of high materialistic tendencies, um, generally speaking, is whether you feel um, secure and safe. And a lot of that comes from your if your basic needs for security and safety and love aren't met in childhood it can actually cause you to feel that you need external validation all the time. And to a greater or lesser extent, depending on whether our needs were met as a child, it can have a big influence on your money uh, habits, behaviors um, and um, um, actions. Now, there are also situations where materialism can become a, a very dominant um, sense in people's lives. And that's if they have a serious life traumatic event. So it could be like a divorce redundancy, death of a loved one, anything that has a massive impact on attacking your personality, your sense of who you are, the sense of value. And sadness and insecurities lead you often to need to external acceptance and recognition from others through things like spending and, and earning, not just that. And, and therefore, that then affects your, your what you actually do with your money. But the problem with that approach is that if your happiness and your, this year. and your self worth um, are always linked to your net worth and what others think of what you see, loans, hang on a minute. Uh, I'm not sure if um, I've got, uh, got some noise in the background on here. Just... Hello? Yeah, sorry about that. Just got some uh, noise on the internet there. So the problem with that approach is that your happiness yeah. and self-worth then become highly linked with both your net worth and what others think of what they see you spending your money on. OK. Now, your childhood experiences and the level of nurturing creates what we call your money story. And that money story underpins all of your financial decisions. So my money story was I grew up in a very poor house we had very little money at all and it created two senses uh, in me it created a sense of insecurity that i would never have enough and it also made me um a, a sort of split personality that i would uh, you never knew if tomorrow was going to come so you might as well have fun today and spend your money so that manifested itself in my 20s of being extremely um focused on earning money but i also was very good at spending it and it wasn't until in my early to mid 30s that I started to become quite introspective. And I'll share this with you in a minute about how I actually worked out the role of money and the role of possessions and the role of lifestyle. And I, as I got older, I became much, much more secure in myself and I become much, much less worried about what other people think of me. Uh, and that helped me with my day to day decisions. And, you know, what you spend your money on says more about what you value um, than anything else. Now. Marketing and advertising is all about tapping into those insecurities and it's all about trying to get your emotional response to convince you that buying goods or services will make you happier by appearing more respected, more worthy, smarter looking or more attractive okay, to other people. But the problem, as I said before, is that you can't ever be truly happy 
when you're trying to get acceptance and approval from others because there's always going to be someone with more money more friends better looks and having more fun than you and that their idea of what matters might not actually be the same as yours so it's just a loser's game now let's do another poll question just to sort of get a sense of this i just want to know have you bought anything in the last three months that you didn't really need and now you regret buying so yes lots of times yes a few times um, yes, it was once and only something of small value. Or no, I never buy things that I don't need. So let's just launch that poll. Vote away, please. Honesty, if you can, that'd be great. Okay. Great. Okay. Right, so we've got 13% of you, um, yes, have bought loads of things that you regret. 44%, yes, a few times. 32, yes, but it was once and only something of small value. And 11% of you are so well organized and so disciplined. It's unbelievable. Um, I'm, you know, it, it, I'm, I'm just wondering if, um, you know, you could, you should be doing the webinar rather than me. But the reality for all of us is that, that the vast majority of people do suffer from buyer's regret. And that's just, that's okay. You know, don't beat yourself up on it. It's, it just happens. Now, let's just move on and talk about this issue of celebrities. Now, celebrity endorsement. Now, celebrities are the ultimate influencers when it comes to getting you to spend your money. Now, it doesn't matter whether a company is hiring them to endorse their products or you're seeing now, whether it's Rihanna or uh, any of these major stars, they're all now started to get behind their own fashion brands, their beauty brands. Look at Victoria Beckham. They'll all be getting their own brands because they know if they've got social media following, if they've got a media exposure, that they personify the good life. But as we all know, it, it, it doesn't really lead to that because at the end of the day, their need to make money has got nothing to do with your sense of self-worth and your happiness. But, um, you know, there's a massive, massive industry out there. And the industry which we know feeds off of this is just one example, the the beauty industry is another one but fashion was invented to make people feel completely in, in, um, inferior and the whole fashion industry is still, like we have you know what's in what's out and it's all about feeding our need for acceptance from other people now if anyone sees me doing a live event you'll know that um, you know I don't take myself very seriously when it comes to fashion I couldn't give a monkeys what you think of me quite frankly because I know all about me but the problem there is that I'm not that too bothered about what it is I wear. And it's only because the grace of God of having, you know, a wonderful wife who makes sure that I don't go out looking like a, as she says, you know, um, a hobo or a homeless person that, that I ain't ever managed to wear anything reasonable. But um, I'm not saying don't buy fashion and, and don't and buy nice things. I'm just saying be aware of the fact that you're being played. So I'm not saying don't have fun or don't have variety. We all need to decide what we want in life. We just need to know that we're being played. Um, now, what I want you to do, what I'm suggesting is that you become a lot more self-aware and intentional about the role of money in your life and what you're spending it on so that you've got more control and that you have more fun and that you've got more choice and financial freedom. Now, I'm not going to come up with answers for you today. What I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you some questions and they're not questions I want you to answer on the poll. What they are, they're questions I want you to think about in between socializing and meeting your family and friends and having a good time. I want you to think about these questions um, because I think if you can come up with the answer, then there's a very good chance that you're going to be really, you're going to have a much better relationship in 2019 with money. So let's talk about the first one. First one is what's important about money to you? Now, that's a really simple question, isn't it? But it's not so simple to answer. And the reality is money means different things to different people. Now, what you need to do, the best way to do this question is sit down with someone who's very important to you, your partner, your best friend, a good colleague, someone you trust. And you ask them the question. They ask you it. But don't just ask it once. Whatever answer they come up with, ask them another one. So what's important about that? So it might be what's important about money to you or it enables me to, um, you know, uh, survive. OK, what's important about surviving? Well, if I if I'm surviving, then I can enjoy life. Well, what's important about enjoying life? So it sounds a bit sort of it sounds a bit guru, sort of woo woo, but it really is important to get to the essence of what money really does mean. And you need to strip it right back to the basics. Great question. 
I really commend it to you. Uh, it's a lot harder to think of, but don't take the first answer. And that's why you need to do it with someone, uh, do the questions with someone. Now, this is an interesting one. I've written about this before on my FT column. Um, if you were the only person in the world, but everything still worked and the shops were full, and assuming that you could cope with the loneliness, would you still wear the same clothes? You have the same haircut, wear makeup, eat the same food, drive the same car, live in the same house. You, you get the idea. Now, I know it's a highly unlikely situation. But the thing about that question is what it does is it gets you thinking. It gets you thinking, who are you living life for? Do you you are, aren't you? You've got that car because, you know, there was a um, an advert on television. I don't watch a commercial television, but I was watching um, the variety performance the other night because I wanted to see someone who's on it. And in the break, which um, I put it on mute because I don't want the adverts to tell me what I'm thinking. There was an advert of a, a child being taken to school in a car and the child was a bit embarrassed, clearly, by the car that the mum or dad was driving. Then then it cut to another bit where the, the, they were driving along in a sort of, I don't know, an SUV or whatever it was, some swanky car. And suddenly they were driving to school and they saw their school friends and suddenly they were somebody. And that was all about that whole need for spending and validation. So so that question, too, is a really good, a good one to help you um, work that one out. Now, this third one is a bit of a binary question. Um, it's a more functional one. Could you meet your core living expenses? If you lost your job, you know, for, for six months or so, if you lost your job or were unable to work and if not, how much do you need to save now? It may be three months for you. It might be nine months. It depends on your wider situation, whether you're in a partnership or a couple where one of you works or if you're earning the smaller salary or if you've got low expenses, whatever it is. But until you've got a lump of money that you can just put your hands on, you can't cope with what life throws at you. You know, if you do one of the single biggest re reasons why people get into problem debt or get into deep depression with money is because they never planned for the stuff that life throws at you. And that's something I really commend to you. It's a question you need to. It, it means different things to different people. So whether it's three months, six months, nine months or 12 months, that's a question you should be asking yourself at least every six months. Um, and also, you know, share it with your partner. If you're having issues with your partner, not understanding where you're at, you need to say we need to have this amount of cash before we can do anything else. Um, and, and here's the thing. You don't need to get your uh, the optimum level of cash to meet your core living expenses uh, in the event of an emergency. You just need to make a start on building it because you can still be in your pension scheme and saving for a house and doing other things. But just make a start on it. Question four. Do you know where all your money currently goes, including all those one offs and non monthly items? Now, until you know where your money's going, there's no possible way you can work out whether it's going in places that make sense to you. And it's really funny. I, I download all my banking data into a spreadsheet. You know, obviously, it's the business I'm in. And when I talk to my wife about it, she's always surprised about how much goes where and what have you. And it always starts interesting conversations. But it's not about judging. It's just about the facts. And we have to decide, do you want to spend one thousand three hundred pounds on coffees? You know, is that important? Uh, if it really adds a lot to your day and it's not causing any tension elsewhere, then fine. Get on with it. It's not a problem. But until you've got honesty, until you're honest with yourself and you can do this using online apps and downloadable things, you can you can just print off a, um, a budget. And there is one on the salary finance uh, new uh, financial education website in the resources section. There is a downloadable version, um, but there's lots and lots of different ways of doing this. Uh, and you can use a spreadsheet if you're really keen, but a paper budget just writing down what you've got and working out where it's going is up there with breathing eating and sleeping now this is an interesting one question five is do you know you know whether it's a celebrity a relative or a friend or a colleague who is very well grounded fulfilled and lives a, a low materialistic lifestyle who could be a good role model for you now the reason why like, a role model is good because it, it now, it could also be a role model who you don't want to be like. It could be someone who's a complete train wreck and you want to do everything the opposite of what they're doing to not be like them. But role models are good because because psychological studies show that if you've got someone to emulate or avoid, it helps you with your daily decisions. So that's an interesting one. Um, so there's there's five questions there to think about. Um, and I'm hoping that what those five questions have done is made you stop and think. Stop and think about where you are, the role of money and why you do what you do. Those five questions are a start, both in terms of attitude and in terms of being able to cope with problems. Um, 
there's now I've talked here about mindset and I've talked here about values and why we do what we do. But we also with the new salary finance financial education website, if your employer hasn't made it available, then they will do soon. And on that website, we've got a whole host of videos, guides and tools. But unlike most financial education websites, we don't have millions of blogs that are going to bore you with telling you, you know, stuff over and over again. What we've got, we've built two um, box sets, as it were. Um, so forget Game of Thrones or or any of that stuff. You want to watch season one, which is taking control or season two, which is creating personal wealth. And in those videos, I explain to you um, in bite sizey chunks what you need to know and what you need to do to both take control of money and build personal wealth. There is no rocket science to this, but we are never taught this at home. And most of the way that it's explained to us is either condescending or it's complicated. And I break it down for you in a way that makes sense. So I'll explain to you, you know, about building an emergency fund um, before you worry about paying off expensive debt, which sounds counterintuitive, but I explain why it matters. And, you know, I know this from an academic point of view, but I also know this because I'm a human being and I've been there and I've done it and I know what it's like to not understand the rules of the road. So so as well as today's attitudinal stuff, these videos on the website can help you. And there are, that's the salary finance team, a, a terrific bunch of people. Um, I'm, I'm hiding at the back there. Um, there's a fiver for anyone who can work out where I am. Um, but we really do want you to help. And, and I'm hoping that you know, in 2019 could be the year when you become much better with money, but the foundations rely on you answering those five questions first. And the festive break is a great time to relax, but it's also a great time to reflect. Now, um, I'm very happy in the short period of time we've got left now to answer some questions. Um, do we have anyone who wants to ask a question in the few um, minutes we've got? Let's have a look. Right. OK. First one here is all about social media. Um, yeah. From Jenny. Um, about social media is a problem. Do you think I should come off of social media? Well, it's not for me to tell you um, how to spend your time. But what I can say to you is that people watch lots of television, um, people who see lots of adverts and read lots of magazines and people who look at other people's curated view of their life and what what is matters to them, which is what social media does, they tend to become more anxious. They tend to become um, more unhappier because their their life doesn't meet with that external um, view of the life. And we all know it when we see pictures of models and, you know, they always have like Love Island. I mean, they never had any people that weren't particularly that were ordinary looking, were they? So um, I would suggest you perhaps cut cut down on it or or just don't look at it as much. And, you know, I took off social. I don't, I'm not on Facebook, but I took off the limited social media I have off my phone. So I have to actually go in and look at social media when I'm ready to look at it and when I'm in the right frame of mind. Um, OK, got another question here from Douglas. Um, He's got some issues with his partner. Um, his partner and him don't seem to don't seem to be able to talk about money. Um, well, why don't you start with those five questions, uh, Douglas? Why don't you start with the five questions and just sit down and say, hey, you know, I, I listened to this webinar. There's a few questions here. Let's go through them and see how we get. But the key thing when you talk to your partner about money is to do it in a way that's not judgmental and is not making them feel belittled or that you're attacking them. So use nonviolent communication. Um, look, I'm sorry, I'd love to answer some more of the questions that are coming in here. They're, they're all great stuff and I will try and answer them in, in future communications. Thank you very much for joining me. It's been great having you on. I hope that some of those things have made you stop and think and do have a great, um, great Christmas. Uh, I wish you all the very best of luck with your future money journey. <laughs>